Section 4.5, factoring polynomials. We're going to have three objectives today. First, to factor by finding the GCF, or the greatest common factor. Second, factor by recognizing special products. And third, factor by grouping method. For the first thing we have to do is discuss what a greatest common factor is. And a greatest common factor is a factor that is in all of the terms of a polynomial. In all of the terms of a polynomial. So let's take a look at an example that explains GCF. What is the GCF of the polynomial expression 6x to the third minus 15x squared? Now, to show where GCFs come from, I'm going to use what's called prime factorization. But you don't have to do this every time. But it does make it a little bit easier the first time you see it. So what I would do is I would start by breaking these into their prime factors. And 6 is 3 times 2, both of which are prime factors. You can't break them down any further. And x to the third is really x times x times x. Now, for the second part here, this 15x squared, when we break it into its components, 15 breaks up into 3 times 5, and x squared is just x times x. Now, remember, the definition of a GCF is the factor that occurs in all terms. Well, this is term 1, this is term 2. What factors are in both of those terms, or all of the terms in general? Well, 3 is in both terms, and x squared is in both terms. So in this problem, what we'll notice is that we have 3x squared that's common between both of these terms. So what we can do is write that as our greatest common factor. And you wouldn't write it this way again. You would write it much simpler, but I'm showing all the steps. So you write 3 times x times x as your greatest common factor in the front. And then what you do is say to yourself, well, what's left over? It looks like this is left over here, and it looks like this is left over here. So we carry down our negative sign, don't forget. That co continues to carry down. And we're left with this expression, which really simplifies to 3x squared times 2x minus 5. Now we can check that this is indeed true by distributing this out. And if you distribute this out, which you wouldn't do, again, you don't have to actually do this, it's just to check. This is the answer, by the way, but just to check it, we can distribute. And when we distribute that, we end up getting 3x squared times 2x, which is 6x cubed, and then 3x squared times negative 5, which is negative 15x squared. So we do get back to what we had in the beginning when we check. Now, you don't want to have to do this process every time with prime factorization. So let's do this problem again, and we'll do it a different way. So again, the problem is 6x cubed minus 15x squared. Now, let's make believe we're not using prime factorization and we're just doing this problem as is. Here's what we have to look for. Try and figure out what number goes into both of the coefficients first. And clearly you could start with the 6. What are the factors of 6? Well, 3 and 2. So 3 goes into 6 and so does 2. Well, 2 doesn't go into 15, so that's clearly not common between the both. But 3 does go into 15. So we could start by putting a 3 out front here, just showing that we've taken a 3 out of both of those terms. Now, the next thing you have to do is look at your variables. If we look at our variable factors, we could say, which of these has a lower degree? And we'll notice that they're both x, which is good, because if we have x and y, we have to look at them individually. So since we only have x here, we could look at our x values. Notice that the first term has an x degree of 3, and the second term has an x degree of 2. So that means that we could technically try and pull a 3 out of here, but we can only pull 2 out of here. It's like saying to yourself, you can't take more x's out than you've got. So the most x's we can take out of both of these are two of them. So we take out x squared. So really what you're doing is you're looking at the one that has the lower degree. And the lower degree will dictate how many x's you can pull out. Now the question becomes next, if we didn't use prime factorization, how do we know what ends up here? Because that's what a problem that most students have. They say, all right, well, we can pull the 3x squared out, but what's left over? Here's an easy way to remember. And you're not actually doing this, but think about it this way. Divide every term by the GCF. Because that's technically what you're doing by pulling it out front. You're not actually dividing by it, okay? But again, it's like you're dividing by a 3x squared there. So if you divide each of these by 3x squared, well, the 6 over 3 here, this just becomes 2. x cubed over x is just I'm sorry, x cubed over x squared is just x, because two of these can two of these x's cancel with two of these x's. These are gone, therefore, leaving behind only one of these, just x. So we're left with the 2x now. 
Then on the right hand side, the x squareds cancel, and 15 over 3 is just 5, and then there's a minus sign. So again, our answer is the same, 3x squared times the quantity 2x minus 5, but we don't have to use prime factorization every time to do this. Example 2, recall that the difference of squares is the quantity a minus b times the quantity a plus b equaling a squared minus b squared. Remembering that the middle terms there cancel when you FOIL that out. With that statement, let's determine the factors of the following. So here's what I would do for these problems. I would start by looking at this and writing it in this form to start so we can identify what a and b are. So this is really u squared minus 7 squared, and therefore, since this part here is squared and this part here is squared, this is really a, and this part here is really b. So what we'll notice is that a is u and b happens to be 7. So a simple way to remember this is to take those values and plug them in right here into our formula for a minus b, a plus b. So the result of this tells us that we can factor this into u minus 7 times the quantity u plus 7. So let's take a look at part b now, a little bit more complicated here. So what we'll see with part b is that we clearly don't have difference of two squares if we just look at this initially, but we have to remember that we could always take out a GCF. So for part b, we can clearly see that we have a GCF in this problem. There's an x in both terms, and I can see that 5 goes into both terms. So let's start by taking out 5x out in front and see what remains. Well, if you forget how to do this, just think about, remember, dividing by your GCF and see what remains. Well, the fives would cancel here, leaving behind just simply x squared, and then the x's cancel here, 20 over 5 is 4, so it turns out that this is what the factored form looks like. Well, this is quite convenient, because this term here happens to be an example of difference of two squares. The 5x gets carried down, but this is our difference of two squares. Now, we could simply notice that this is x plus 2x minus 2 when factored, or we can list our a and b values. So we could rewrite this as the following, 5x times the quantity x squared minus 2 squared. And then it's obvious that this is a and this is b. With that said, we could then write our answer out as 5x. And remember, it's a minus b, a plus b. So a minus b, a, and a plus b. So our final answer is 5x times the quantity x minus 2 times the quantity x plus 2. And again, noticing that we have difference of two squares. Let's take a look at part C now, which tells us 25r to the sixth minus 36. Now, at first it doesn't seem like this is difference of two squares, but it actually is difference of two squares. The 36 part is easy. We could rewrite that as 6 squared, but the 25r to the sixth gets confusing. Well, the 5 comes from 25 when you square it. But what quantity squared would give you r to the sixth? We have to remember your laws of exponents. If I put in r to the third here, I'll notice that it's r to the third, and that's squared. And we remember that when you raise a power to a power, you multiply those powers. So if you distributed this 2 here, this would become r to the sixth. This would become 25. So this is what we really have here with a minus sign. So we can clearly see now that this is a and this is b. So our answer is just going to be a minus b, a plus b. Okay, and again, notice this intermediate step is not necessary. You can go from here straight to the answer if you can pick up on it right away. The next thing I want to talk about is factoring by grouping. And this is an example where at times it might be helpful to arrange the terms into groups to be factored. So let's take a look at an example to see this right. So example 3 says for part A to determine the factors of the quantity xy plus 3y plus 2x plus 6. So let's go ahead and take a look at this now. xy plus 3y plus 2x plus 6. The way grouping work is to, works is to look at it in two separate parts. So take an imaginary line and put it down the middle here. What you'll notice is that there's no greatest common factor for all these terms, but there is a GCF out of these two. And there's another GCF out of these two. So let's start on the left. xy plus 3y. Well, there's a y in both terms, so that's your GCF. You can pull it out front, leaving behind x plus 3. On the right-hand side, though, what we're going to notice is that we're going to have no variable expression, but the number 2 can come out of both of these. So if I take out a positive 2, I'm left with x plus 3. And again, you can check to see what you get. 
by dividing by the GCF in each term. But notice that these are the same. That's the key here. When you use factor by grouping, the goal is to get the same factor left behind in both of the terms. Well, x plus 3 is in both terms. If I had something like this, let's do a little side note. If I had yx plus 2x, I could take x out, leaving behind y plus 2. Well, that's the same thing we have here. This x and this x is really this quantity. It's common in both terms. So when there's an x, it's obvious and easy to see. You can take out that x, leaving behind the y and the 2. Same thing goes here. Factor out x plus 3 now, leaving behind y plus 2. So we factor out the x plus 3 in the front, which really, remember, is like dividing by x plus 3 in all these terms. So those are gone, leaving behind y plus 2. So this is our final solution. Now, one thing to note, and you can check this on your own, is that these middle terms, the order does not matter. You could switch the order of the middle terms here, so the 3y and the 2x, you could flip-flop them. And what you would end up getting is, instead of y plus 2 out here, this would become x, and this would be a 3. And then these would be the y plus 2s. So these orders would be switched, but if you remember, multiplication is commutative, it does not matter the order in which they're written. For part b, though, what I'll do is I'll switch the middle terms, because it can be a little bit tricky at times, but let's do it both ways for part b, actually. So for part b, we've got 10r squared plus 2rw minus 5r minus w. All right, for here, let's start by putting our dashed line down the middle. On the left-hand side, we'll see that a 2 can come out of everything, and so can an r, leaving behind 5r minus w. And over here, we'll notice that, I'm sorry, 5r plus w. And on the right-hand side, what we'll notice is that this is a negative 5r and a negative w, but we want it to be the same as whatever this is. So let's take a negative 1 out of both of these, and that's where you have to use a little intuition there. If you notice that negative 1 can come out of both, you're left with 5r plus w, and therefore we have the same term, so we can now factor out 5r plus w, leaving behind 2r, and you have to remember that there's a minus 1. That minus 1 is extremely important now, because not only is it a coefficient, but it also becomes a placeholder for your binomial. So this would be your answer for this one. But a lot of people don't pick up on the negative 1. So you might have gotten stuck when you factor this out. You factor out the 2r and you get stuck here, you're not knowing what to do. Well then at that point, just switch the order of the middle terms and go ahead and do the problem. So I'm going to do that just to prove that we do get the same answer. So alternate solution, 10r squared plus 2rw minus 5r minus w. Now I'm going to switch the middle terms, take them and reorder them. So it becomes minus 5r plus 2rw. And now it might be a little bit easier. Put your dashed line down the middle. Let's take a look at what our GCF is. On the left-hand side, uh, it looks like a 5 can come out, and so can an r. That'll leave me at 2r here, and this is going to be a minus 1. And then over here, it looks like we can take out a w, leaving behind, again, 2r minus 1. 2r minus 1 is common in both terms, so we factor it out leaving behind 5r plus w. And notice that your answer, whether it's here or up here, is the exact same thing, just written in a different order. But again, multiplication is indeed commutative, so it does not matter. The next thing is to use factoring sum and difference of cubes. And this is one of our special products, like difference of squares that we did a minute ago, but it's a little bit more complex. So in the case where you have a sum or a difference, that's why the plus or minus comes into play, of two things that are cubed, we can use this following formula if we can identify a and b. Now, the plus or minus simply tells us that if we're using a positive, if there's a sum, we're going to use this, to, this positive and we're going to use this negative in our answer. But if our example was the difference of cubes and it was like something where there's a minus, we're going to use the bottom signs here and here. Every other sign just remains the same, but those signs where you see the double either use all the top or use all the bottom based on what you started with. Now it's important to know what our cubes are, so quickly let's list our cubes on the side. 1 cubed is 1, 2 cubed is 8, 3 cubed is 27, 4 cubed is 64, 5 cubed is 125. It's really all you have to go to. We're not going to get much higher, but 6 cubed is 216. 
You're really not going to go beyond that in this class. So let's just remember those, though, because it's useful to have those in the back of our mind. So let's use these numbers to take a look at our examples now. Using the sum and difference of cube patterns above, determine the factors of. So we want to use those sum and difference of cubes. So we'll recall these from the previous slide here at the top. Now, let's start actually with example B here. And then I'll go back to example A, because after realizing example A doesn't give us a good interpretation of this, but example B will. So let's start with example B. Example B tells us 8x to the third minus 27. Well, the thing is this. If you notice that both of these are cubes, it makes this a lot easier. 8 is a perfect cube. It's really just two cubed. And x cubed is also a perfect cube. 27 happens to be a perfect cube. It's three cubed. So you start by rewriting this as the following. Now, what you'll notice is that we have 2x is a and 3 is b. And that makes this problem a lot easier, because now we've identified that this is a difference of cubes, so we can use the bottom symbol for these three. Okay, and we can write these out if we've already identified a as 2x and b as 3. So we can simply just plug into this formula and come up with our answer. So it turns out that this factors into, and again, it's going to be a minus b, so 2x minus 3 times. Now it's a squared, so it's the quantity 2x squared plus a times b plus the quantity b squared. Now we just have to simplify this. The 2x minus 3 remains the same, but now the quantity 2x squared is really 4x squared. 2x times 3 is really plus 6x, and then 3 squared is 9. So our solution, or our factored form, is quantity 2x minus 3 times the quantity 4x squared plus 6x plus 9. Alright, now let's look at part A. And part A is actually easier, but it's kind of tricky at first if you start with that one. So I wanted to start with part B. So part A is just y cubed might, uh, plus 1. Well, if we write this as the sum of cubes, it's really y cubed plus 1 cubed. So it turns out that in this problem, a just happens to be the y, and b happens to be 1. Okay, so this is a, and this is b here. It's already written as cubes. That's why it's a little misleading at first. So we're just going to apply and plug in our formula, remembering that our formula becomes the quantity a plus b for sums times a squared minus a b plus b squared. So let's go ahead and plug in what we know. a plus b is really y plus 1. A squared is just the y squared minus a, which is y, times b, which is 1, plus b squared, which is 1 squared. And simplifying to make it look pretty only, y plus 1 times the quantity y squared minus y plus 1. And finally, part c. Part c says 2u to the fourth plus 54u. It looks at first like neither of these are cubes. But if you factor out a 2u out of everything, this becomes 2u times the quantity u to the third plus 27. And this can be written as 2u times u to the third plus 3 to the third. And now it's a little bit more obvious what our values are here. So it turns out that a is just u and b is just the 3. So we have to carry down the 2u and then do this problem like we did the other. So this is sum of cubes, so it's going to be u plus 3 parentheses, u squared minus, now a times b is going to be th u times 3, or 3u, plus b squared, which is just 9 at the end. And your homework from this section is from section 4.5, and the review from page 72.